Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Julia, thanks for taking some time to have a chat with me on the show. We really appreciate it. No worries. Thank you, Owen. Thanks for having me. I thought maybe uh, in, just in doing my research, I thought maybe a, a good way to start would be uh, just to ask you, I know you have teenage daughters, how you try and explain to them what you do and how you go about teaching them about investing or money, or even if you've just tried to broach that subject at all, any of the kind of the wisdom that you can give myself and listeners would be very much appreciated. Sure. Okay. Um, I do have teenage daughters. One is going into year 12 and the other one is in year nine. Uh, so I have talked to them about investing in the past. Um, and they, they do, they do show a lot of interest and they certainly show a lot of interest in wanting to be independent, which I think, well, for anybody is important, but, you know, certainly mm-hmm. for, for, for young girls is extremely important in my opinion. Um, when I described what I did to them when they were very young, I said that I was a fund manager and, of course, they interpreted it as a fund manager, um, which... <laughs> <laughs> which um which I like to think is you know one and the same but um I guess they 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 understand uh, if you if say if I take them shopping on the weekends and we go to say JB Hi-Fi or you know shopping at Woolies they understand that you know those are you know components of listed companies and the money that we spend there goes into form I guess part of their bottom line so they they do understand the concept of you know corporates and uh, the idea of profits and my daughter that's in year 12 um, she's studying commerce business or economics business and uh, and law so she and they're the areas that she wants to go into so she has a keen interest on it so um, I do I do try to broach with them you know the, the value of investing and also the value of being independent. Do, do you think that either of them will go into the field, into investing or business, like the corporate life, generally speaking? Absolutely. My oldest one, that's exactly what she wants to do. The youngest one, um, I think she'd like to be an investor, but uh, I, don't, I don't think she'll follow that path. Mm-hmm. Um, it's always an interesting thing, right? Because a lot of, particularly teenagers, they're, they're either, it's kind of binary, they're either into it or they're not. And um, if you can find some a young person that's interested, they obviously have one of the secret ingredients of long-term investing and wealth creation, which is time. They've got all of that on their side. So having a mentor like you, I imagine, would be invaluable to, to them. Um, I normally ask this question at the end, but I feel like this might be something that is interesting now is um, if you had advice for them uh, and you would be willing to share it with us now, what would you say to them if you were in their position right now? Uh, I th- what the value of compound investing, which is just the, the point that you just raised, it's, you know, one of those miracles, compound investing, um, but also confidence, uh, which is, it's hard to teach somebody, but I think that's probably one of the areas that I lacked starting. And, you know, I guess confidence in myself. Um, it's not something you can teach. Yeah. No, but it, it is a fair thing, right? We particularly, I, I find with the younger analysts, they often think that there's so much that they don't know um, and they, uh, they lack confidence because there's so much uncertainty. But I think as you go on, the, the uncertainty is still there, but you just learn to manage it in a different way. And that's and just purely from a professional perspective. And this leads us actually nicely into my first, my first question to you um, on, on your career, which was um, you started as an analyst in 1994, I believe. I did, yes. What was that like? Did you always know that you were going to become an analyst? Um, I guess it was complicated by the fact that um, prior to that, um, I finished my economics degree uh, in at the end of 1990. So I came into the job market in the recession we had to have, which was, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you had to be there because it was it was a really hard recession and it, it lasted for years and it was devastating to Australia. So. Um, in terms of seeking a job at that time after finishing an economics degree, 
um, the financial sector was laying people off. So there was no prospect of, of going into that field. There was accounting and auditing, which I had tried and didn't really enjoy. Um, so I actually went into working for the Attorney General's Department investigating organised crime. So that's how I, that's, that's how I got into it. Um, and I guess once the economy picked up, which was by late 1993, there were opportunities in finance again. So that was that was my foot into the area. This is a I didn't know this about uh, your, your backstory. Normally, I have a pretty good handle on um, the the backstory of guests coming on the program. So you investigated organized crime. Um, that was kind of your research. That's your first exposure to research out of school. Or yes, uni. that's right. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so, okay, interesting uh, segue here, but. Uh, maybe it's a more of a digression which is just did any of those skills transfer to becoming an analyst absolutely now you gotta remember this was pre-internet so it was uh in terms of reconstructing accounts it was bank statements it was check stubs it was transcripts of telephone intercepts and listening devices it was uh it was a lot more creative and a lot more, uh, you had to be a lot more resourceful the other thing would be uh, probably just questioning and, and inter- interviewing techniques did you did you was there something about that like that made you want to leave that field or was it just the you know I've always wanted to be in finance and and work in um, investment research rather than say organized crime was that just the was the allure of that or was there something that kind of pushed you away from that that industry um I I think you know the allure of, of of working in finance was always there so I guess once circumstances changed and and I mean it was it was slightly depressing work too so um so it, it was nice to jump across but it, it was it was a massive culture difference i can imagine how would you describe the speaking of um in investment markets how would you describe the culture um when you moved across um well i guess i went from working in a what was a fairly grotty building uh in kent street behind bulletproof glass um, to uh, working in, you know, the best office building up on level 39 with my own office and a view of the water, uh, view of the harbour. Um, so it went from one extreme to the other. <laughs> um, yeah, I left a whole lot of great people uh, and I, you know, ended up working with a whole lot of great people, but I guess the, the surroundings were completely different. Can you describe to us then that kind of that formative stage in your, your analyst career? Um, kind of the key moments that the people know now as being a portfolio manager and a very successful one at that. Um, can you describe some of the key roles that you've had over time and some of the lessons you've learned? I know that you invested through the GFC, for example. Um, any kind of stories or anecdotes that you can leave us with that helped you become who you are today? Um, I guess um, switching over into what was then called the listed property trust sector in 1994, um, was a sector that nobody wanted to be in. So there was an opportunity to go in into that into that area. Um, I guess at that point you had the bond rate that was starting at about 11% back then and it's it's fallen ever since. And you know, I guess in the last two years it's continued to fall. Although we have seen an uptick quite recently. Um, I, um, I mean, I've seen a lot of different cycles. Like the, the worst one for real estate was the GFC, so 2007, 2008. And um, one of the REIT companies was actually the canary in the coal mine for um, for Australia um, in its, I guess it's... Which REIT was that, sorry? That was Centro, Centro Property Group, um, oh, yep. which, yep. you know, effectively collapsed. And that was, one, they were over-levered, and two, they had lots of short-term debt that needed to be rolled against, an, you know, an asset class that was, you know, overvalued. So, um, you know, had a... Had a um, a debt mismatch in terms of timing so um in, into a falling asset market where nobody wanted to buy assets so that was i guess that was um that was kind of the the, the formative steps into the gfc for the sector and also for australia i mean it was just kind of like somebody ringing the bell um so that was that was it you know the gfc was not kind to the REIT sector um and a lot of retail investors unfortunately were burnt um because the sector was over levered it had it invested in asset classes that it didn't understand it, it had invested offshore um it had uh you know a complexity of financial structures to make it more appealing which just started to unravel which ended up by just being debt on debt um so it, it, you know it wasn't kind to retail investors and um you know, a lot of retail investors have missed out ever since, unfortunately. So interesting example in Centro 
I'm, I'm sure many of our listeners would remember Centro. Um, did you, could, could you see this coming in, in, in the sense of, you know, those, those shorter term um, debt profiles, could you see them rolling off and were you questioning what could happen? Um, we, we held virtually none of that stock, which was um, a function of where we saw the, the asset class being overvalued, um, but we were very mindful of the, the amount of leverage and leverage on leverage in a number of structures. Um, and up until that point, it actually cost us a lot of performance because, um, you know, at that point in the cycle, just before it tipped over, you know, that was being rewarded by the market because it was able to generate returns. It's just that those returns weren't sustainable. Um, so it had cost us a lot of performance, but fortunately we stuck with it. And when the, when unfortunately the tipping point happened, um, you know, our performance improved a lot because not only did we not own that, we, we didn't own a lot of the stocks that looked like that at the time. I spent time um, in a former life in a research role and we looked at um, listed property trusts and, and REITs and the like. And we found some interesting patterns in or with regard to how much leverage they use in certain times or certain at, at certain stages of the cycle. Um, looking back on it now, you mentioned there was kind of like a tipping point. Um, did you kind of draw any rules of thumb or kind of, you know, big picture ideas about when you're in that, that bull market in property, um, when it's important to be careful and how, like any of the, the telltale signs that you might be going too far. And what I mean, like, for example, as, as one example, we looked at the, the leverage and we found that um, many funds that had 30% gearing or less seemed to hold up okay. But those beyond that seemed to you know, get washed out a little bit. So I, I, I don't know if you have anything off the top of your head that just generally speaking, you kind of use now as, as part of your framework. Um, I guess since that, since that point in time, um, the REIT sector has delevered, but they've also looked at extending the leverage too, so the, the, the debt duration. So, you know, you're not, you're not caught short. Um, and I guess um, what we saw with COVID is that the Fed stepped in uh, and bought um, uh, credit uh, because they were really worried about companies that had to come to market to refinance, that had debt, debt refinancing um, uh, obligations. So um, we're very mindful, and we were mindful at the time of, of, of debt duration uh, and exposures. Uh, there was no absolute cap on leverage because it can work for you, provided that the underlying cash flow is sustainable uh, and that the asset value itself um, has, you know, there's barriers to entry or there's like long term value attached to it. Um, uh, but it, yeah, it's all it all depends on the circumstances. But for that that one was, you know, that was that was obvious to us at the time. We'll get to more of your investment philosophy philosophy in just a moment. But one of the things that um, I, I wanted to ask you was basically how do you spend your your average Tuesday? Um, one of our uh, designers here talks about designing her ideal life and an ideal Tuesdays. I don't know why it's a Tuesday, but I thought I'd ask you what does an average Tuesday look like for Julia Forrest? Ah, uh, well. Last two years aside, um, which, you know, it's been spent a lot at home, um, I try to start really early. I also live in the northern beaches of Sydney, which um, if you come in, you know, after a certain time, the traffic is gridlocked. So I try and get in at around 6.30 in the morning. So um, I'm pretty efficient at uh, waking up and getting out of the house. So I can do it. I can do it in four or five minutes between wake up time and leaving the house. Wow. It's just pretty, yeah. Anyway, years of training. <laughs> um, I shower the night before I put my clothes out and basically get dressed and walk out of the, walk out the door. Um, uh, I guess it's, you know, checking my emails on the way in. Um, I still like physical papers to read, which, you know, I'm 52. I don't know whether that's an age thing. I like to be able to see all the stories, whereas I guess when you're online, you can click on things that sound interesting, whereas if you look at a newspaper, you see everything. It's, um, it's just my own personal preference. Um, you know, then I, I, you know, I read broken notes. Um, we have a morning meeting. We've, we're really lucky. We've got a, you know, big equities um team and so everybody's got different skill sets uh and we've got a good fixed income team you know you, you mentioned that you'd spoken to uh, Wimble Gore before we've got a you know, great fixed income team as well so we get together and we talk through ideas talk through stock ideas um and then you know basically come back to our desks go through portfolios you know look the market opens um talk to brokers talk to companies talk to industry contacts um it's just you know and, and it reiterates during the day so um that's that's a typical Tuesday it's interesting because when I speak to people involved in on the property side of the ledger, I find that 
so much of it is still or not still but is net, kind of based on your network and sp speaking extensively to who's in the industry and how you know that connection and what's their relationship to this deal that's going to happen and i feel like that's a, a significant edge where say on the equity side many investors well like when i say equities i mean like you know industrials and that type of stuff um they tend to well, we tend to be a bit more kind of i guess shallow and not as ingrained in exactly every deal and everything that's coming up um i, I noticed when i was looking at your linkedin profile for example that um there's a circle of people that um are in the sector and have been in the sector for a long time so it's fascinating um just coming back to you getting up early um i think getting up at 6 30 or getting into the office six, six, at 6.30 from the Northern Beaches is quite a stretch. So um, that makes one of us um, that can get to the office at 6.30. Um, how, how about now if we turn to your investment philosophy, Julia, and just talking um, generally, because we'll dive into the process in just a moment, but I guess just the investment philosophy, that 30,000 foot view, um, what are you looking for? And kind of what are, you, what are you, the beliefs that you or the team follow to construct a portfolio? Well, I guess it comes, personally, it comes back to, I guess, your, as I said before, um, when I finished my economics degree in 1990, came out into the recession, um, it's, I think it's, I mean, it scars you uh, seeing that, but it's made me very risk averse um, in my own personal investing, but also from a portfolio management perspective as well. So I guess we focus, we're very risk focused. Um, so uh, my colleague and I, um, uh, we, where I, I guess we was looking at the downside risk um, and we treat our client's money like it's our own. We just don't want to lose it. You know, so we we tend to underperform in periods of euphoria when the market goes straight up, but we tend to outperform when the market either goes down, goes sideways or goes up gradually. Um, so uh, I think the, the, we put a framework around it that is is very risk focused. Um, in terms of our investment philosophy, um, investing in, in real estate is all about um, the asset itself, um, having a good site, having barriers to entry. It's all about your ability to attract and retain tenants. Um, and you don't want a substitutable product. I mean, I guess one of the problems with retail real estate in the last five, seven years is really that there's been a substitute, which is, you know, virtual online, which is open ended supply, which means that what used to be big barriers to entry of having a regional shopping centre, you know, there were no more regional shopping centres allowed to be built in Australia, um, you know, you've, which provided, I guess, you know, this, this barrier um, and, you know, this 20 years of, of incredible returns um, disappeared because you had this open ended supply. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, we're, we're mindful of, of um, barriers to entry, um, substitutability, um, but good management, uh, good development ability, uh, and then for some asset classes, also the um, desire to sell. So for office property, which is, tends to be quite cyclical, um, it's obviously good to buy and good to buy sites and develop them, but also selling at particular points in time is a discipline um, that should be rewarded as well. But for those listeners that don't know, you effectively straddle both of those sides. So you've got the retail component and the office component or the market there. How do you, if, you just, if you're just describing, just to set the scene for our listeners, if you're describing basically what are the key differences between those two markets, and you mentioned supply um, in, in office there and being more cyclical, um, how do you kind of, um, we've got, we'll get to your investment process. Maybe this is the way we can do it is to illustrate basically how you look at those two different sub-asset classes. So how do you look at office versus how you look at retail? And I guess that sets the scene for talking through your process from here. Um, well, I guess in terms of retail, um, particularly the big malls, you know, the big malls that your listeners would be familiar with, you know, the Westfields, um, we had been underweight that asset class for a long period of time, premised on, I guess, substitutability, leakage of spending to the internet, which impacts retailers wanting to expand, which, you know, impacts um, pricing tension for rents um, and occupancy and rental growth. So uh, not to mention, you know, asset values, uh, you know, obviously the cash flows drive the asset values. And if the cash flows are under pressure because you don't have the retailers wanting to commit or you don't have competition for space, so you don't have rental growth, it impacts the actual asset value itself. Uh, so we had been underweight that sector for quite a long period of time. Um, we had seen rental spreads um, 
becoming negative, which is basically, you know, you sign a five-year lease as a specialty uh, tenant, you get to the end of your five-year lease and the rent that you're paying, um, say you're paying $1,500 a square metre, um, maybe that drops down to $1,300 a square metre um, because the market has been under pressure because of this substitutability and this, I guess, this less competition to space. So, you know, that's put pressure on cash flows and pressure on values. We had been underweight that, you know, COVID reset that really in a big way. Um, so that the rents have been reset uh, downwards to more sustainable levels um, and all the power really vested with the tenant rather than the landlord. So you have this great reset, um, which has reset rents to much more affordable levels uh, and asset values have been reset too. Um, office is a funny asset class, the way it's performed in the last two years. It didn't perform anywhere near the way people expected. Um, you know, you had this big structural tailwind um, um, for office for so long and it turned into a structural headwind you know people wanted to be in the city for a long period of time they wanted to be in the best space and with COVID obviously you know everybody had the ability and, and desire to work from home so you know this what turned from a structural tailwind turned to a structural headwind obviously had a, a cyclical downturn just being economic activity generally um, but the the office val asset values continue to hold. They, 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 they continue to be very strong, despite the fact that you know your demand is probably under a bit of pressure. Um, and so you know you've got developers are still keen to develop office assets, uh, even though you've got the vacancy rates gone from maybe three or four percent up to ten percent, and rents have fallen maybe. 20, 25% in net effective terms, um, but office values have stayed the same, which is not something we've seen before. Um, normally asset values follow where rents go, it just hasn't happened this time. There's just been a big disconnect. And I think that's partly a function of what, what's happened with bonds uh, and people just seeking physical assets um, where I guess they're probably trading at a discount to replacement cost. So just to, just to clarify on that, so are you saying that basically because of where bonds are, the office spaces are more desirable, uh, the office properties are more desirable. Is that what you're saying? I suspect that's probably the case. You know, people are just wanting to invest in physical assets. Maybe they're allocating away from fixed income um, and uh, putting more and more money into to office and, and real assets. And is that pr primarily because oftentimes they're like CPI plus or they're, they're protected in some way? They, are, they, they do have fixed increases. So annual escalators of maybe three, three and a half percent a year. Is In your mind, is that... Um, is that a legitimate kind of, uh, I guess, trade-off, a, a tilt of a portfolio in, in respect of, you know, does it actually make sense if vacancy rates are so high, um, should, those, should those prices be resetting? Uh, I guess it depends on what they're allocating away from. If they're allocating away from bonds, which maybe are yielding, or were yielding 1.5% or 1%, then maybe that makes an astute maybe it's fairly astute and you've got some uh, inflation protection. So it depends on what you're allocating away from, but just for us in, in the sense that um, you've probably got a cash flow that's probably gonna remain under pressure for the next few years. Um, we just, we've had a preference for other asset classes, um, whether it's um, more recently, malls, I guess, given that you've, you've seen a rental reset um, or industrial logistics assets, um, you know, childcare, uh, other asset classes have just seemed better value to us. One of the things that I guess there's two things here when we'll dig into both of them, but the first one is um, on the retail side of things, people are kind of skeptical, I guess, coming out of COVID if places like the local Westfield are still going to be as busy. I think it, I read in an interview or um, I think it was something you said, basically that it's the responsibility of the landlord. So Westfield to get foot traffic and it's the responsibility of the retailer to make money from yeah, to convert traffic. it. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a symbiotic um, relationship. Yeah, it is. Right. Yeah, it um, is. If, and they, sh they, they could both, I guess, win. They should both win. Um, but I guess some people are skeptical, Julia, that we're, we're going to return to malls in the same, in the same capacity that we did prior to COVID, whether that's because we're shopping more online or, you know, insert any reason. Um, are you are you seeing that over the medium term we are going to make that shift back? And I guess the the second question around that is, um, what are some of the more innovative things that landlords and um, shopping centres, for example, are doing to get people back in sooner? Well, we have seen a big so as the you know the economies have been opening up, we have seen a big bounce back in spending. Uh, so we saw it last time in uh, August September 
October last year. Um, so we saw this, I guess you'd call it revenge spending. People uh, had cash to spend. They, you know, they hadn't spent money on holidays. We do expect the same thing to happen this period of time. The difference this time versus last, pe last period is that asset prices have probably gone up 20, 25% as well. So they've got cash to spend and they're feeling wealthy. Uh, they've also missed out on a couple of school holidays. So they, you know, they do have money to spend. Uh, in terms of it being sustainable, um, I guess the landlords are really remixed centres to include more services um, that bring you back um, to them all. Um, so you have you have seen you've seen a rebound in traffic, not to the same extent as, as where it was in 2019, but people are actually spending more when they're there. They're staying shorter periods of time, um, they're going less, but they're spending more. So the conversion rates are higher. So that's interesting. So and can I ask, how, how do you how do you get a gauge on that? How do you get a gauge on how much consumers are spending? Are you looking at official statistics or are you doing your own work, reading down your reports or where do you get that information from? Well, you can see it in in like CBA spending data, um, but you can, the, the, the more landlords also release it themselves. Just while we're on this topic of getting people physically back to, to locations, um, I think I read that during COVID, um, e-commerce or online spending um, effectively went from, I think it was 9% to 12 or, or something like that. And then there's a, there's a, I don't know my numbers right in front of me, but going up to some estimates suggest around 20 to 25%. Um, I also, I think it was from your colleague, but I actually read something similar, which basically suggested that um, it just transfers the spending in a different way. So, and, and for property, it can transfer that to industrial assets rather than retail assets. But for retail specifically, do you see that as a, a, as a threat or, or, or a kind of an opportunity for property investors? Well, it's both. Uh, it, you just have to own the best assets. Um, I think during COVID, uh, I mean, you did see that big flight to online spending, um, but the retailers have actually uh, you, you know, use that opportunity to close their bottom five to 10% stores, which has actually made them um, more resilient. Um, they're not probably not going to open as many stores as they have in the past. So they, they're really going to open stores in the best centres. So I think you have to be choosy about which centres you're in. Um, I don't think all centres will do well. I think there'll be some that probably um, you'll see parts of them close down and maybe reconverted to other purposes, whether it's, you know, student accommodation or built to rent. Um, or health, um, not all of them will survive, but the ones that do survive, I think will, will do reasonably well, particularly now that you've seen rents reset to more sustainable levels. It's interesting, right? Because I, I often, I speak to a lot of investors and, and um, I think the way it's all framed is very interesting insofar as the way we're seeing retail premises go. It's like you said, services, like people go there to drop their kids off, so they may as well do their shopping. Um, if, if there's a hotel, that well, they're going to be spending in that location. Like I know Chadston here in Victoria yeah. has something had something similar, right? Yeah. Um, but even even things like the movies and the cinemas, people have been predicting for a long time that they would there was the demise was Netflix and all this type of stuff. But I think we overlooked the fact that people go there not just for consumption but also for entertainment. Yes. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I was desperate to get out after whatever it was, 105 days of lockdown, um, and I can't wait for the new James Bond movie to start. So. I was just about to say the same thing. <laughs> And you can't watch so that long. at home. <laughs> That's a shared experience. It's true. It's true. Yes. I did try and watch, um, this is a huge digression from investing, but I did watch uh, the Black Widow movie from home and it just did come out of the cinemas as well. So it's almost like I have to go back and watch it again. But I, I think for investors, right, that's actually something that we probably, many of us have overlooked in, insofar as um, people genuinely do want to get out and do want to go to these premises. So they're still going to be valuable. So once the reset happened, um, it was the time to rotate in. And I noticed because I did in, in doing some prep, I, I noticed that the A-REIT index is actually back to where it was basically pre-COVID. Um, was that, is that a surprise to you? It is remarkable. Um, when you think about what happened during COVID and the code of conduct, which was a national code of conduct, which basically said that uh, landlords had to help uh, tenants um, insofar as um, forbearing, you know, forbearance on rents, or deferrals. Um, they didn't do that with the banks. That was just a deferral. That was, you know, it's not like the bank said, look, you don't need to pay us interest for uh, for three or six months. And and by the way, we'll just forget about it. That was just, it was just deferred. But the, the actual landlords, they took that hit. Um, and, you know, it's, it was the only sector in the economy that really did. So for them to have bounced back is really quite remarkable. 
the other thing that that is, is that the value of real estate basically comes from the length of the leases. And there's typically leverage that is applied against the, the length of those leases because they're, you know, basically foreseeable, sustainable cash flows. And so when you sever the length of the lease by this legislation, um, you know, the whole sector, you know, the whole asset class could have come unwound. Um, because do you think about all the leverage that's up against it, uh, and the sanctity of the lease, you know, being a legal contract uh, was severed, um, was just unthinkable. So the fact that um, the sector has gone back to where it was pre-COVID is really quite remarkable. Yeah, I, I think, you know, if we imagine if you're um, investing in an industrial company, you're doing discounted cash flow analysis, or you're doing some cash flow modeling, and all of a sudden it's down 20%, um, that has a significant impact, not only on your the interim free cash flows, but also on the terminal value, right? Which is yes, the, basically right. the majority of the asset value. So that's a that's a really interesting thing. I um sorry, Julie, I think I just missed something in the in the notes here that I wanted to go back to, which was just around this uh the 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 factors that you look for when you when you bring when you start researching one of these assets because um I know I know you've got proprietary kind of modeling and techniques that you use at Pendle, but um the, the the lease factors kind of brought me up, brought me onto this. Um, can you just describe maybe in a general sense some of the things that go into your own modeling and how you score and how you kind of um, quantitatively or qualitatively assess, you know, let's say like a REIT or a fund or, or something like that? Um, so in terms of our valuation, we have um, two parts to it. So the first part is the PE, um, which the, the earnings we forecast. So that's just a function of where we think um, rents will be, um, where interest costs will be based on capital management. Uh, and then um, the, the actual PE that we apply um, is determined by nine quality score factors. Um, so that determines what the PE is that we apply. And of those nine um, quality factors, five of them relate to management. Uh, so it's management's ability to, um, I guess, add value to, to those earnings, either to sustain it or to actually enhance it. Um, so that's the first part. The second part is a breakup valuation. So again, it's forecasting earnings uh, and then applying a, a multiple for those earnings. Um, and that's, that's we use a cap rate, which is basically, I guess you could think about it as the inverse of, of a PE. Um, so it's just kind of it's just a, a percentage that we with, that we use to determine the value of the real estate. Um, so we apply a cap rate based on where we see um, the cap rate for that particular asset class or that particular asset. Um, so our valuations are a combination of those two outcomes, and then we rank those relative to each other, and we try to own the ones that are compelling value and own less, less of the ones that aren't. Yeah. So um, on the in the A rate. Uh, index here in Australia, the, the, of course it's A-REIT, um, there's about 35 securities, but um, depending on which fund we're talking about, you can um, invest outside of that a little bit as well. We can, as yes, well. that's right. Yes, and we have in the past, yes. And I guess the process probably wouldn't change whether it's listed or unlisted because you still have an estimate of earnings and quality and those types of things. Right? That's right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing that um, I know a lot of our listeners would be keen for me to ask you about is basically... So we've talked about retail. Now we're talking about the office a bit more. Um, the work from home movement has changed the way many businesses operate. Um, I, I, I think it was you that said, or it came from the, the, the Lend Lease. I think you were quoting Lend Lease or something like this, where you said, that basically employer, employers have to earn the commute of employees. And I'm hearing anecdotally that some people who are hiring in this market are basically having to offer 100% flexibility if the employee wants that. Um, how does how does that, in your opinion, impact office prices? Like we've talked about it in terms of supply. Do you think that the, the level of supply that we have in major cities at the moment, for example, is too much? Uh, I think there's a lot of old stock, which isn't fit for purpose anymore. Um, so when I was quoting Len uh, about earning the commute, I guess you've got to have premises that are fit for purpose. Um, so modern, uh, offer amenity, um, uh, and then ESG credentials as well, which is extremely important. So um, I think there's probably too much supply of, of older stock. Um, obviously the supply of newer stock will appeal to tenants and you will see tenants gravitate out of the old stock towards the new stock, but the absolute levels of vacancy will hang on and depress rents generally. That's interesting you brought up uh, ESG because we've had is it neighbours ratings for quite mm -hmm. some time. That's right. Yes. 
ESG is now, uh, I guess, a much bigger focus, not only of property investors and, and landlords, but also just generally every company, you know, is almost being expected to report on um, emissions and those types of things and their impact on the environment. Are you seeing that kind of come down the pike now? Is that what you, you were referring to before from ESG? Absolutely. The, the tenants are saying, no, this has to be better. Yes, that's right. It's it's very t- uh, tenant demanded. Um, so um, tenants only want to go into buildings with good ESG credentials. Um, and for, you know, obviously the E part uh, is, is the part that they're really focusing on. So they want them to be sustainable, whether they're, you know, they're um, run on renewable energy. Um, they, you know, even the actual, you know, the building and the built form itself, you know, the amount of carbon that's gone into a new development, um, uh, whether it can be offset or, you know, whether it's used with recycled materials. Um, they're, they're very mindful of it, particularly tenants that find it difficult to do um, much like their energy companies. You know, they, they definitely want to move into a building that's got good uh, environmental credentials. Do you find that in terms of um, the rents themselves that the corporates are willing to pay more for this? You know, do you think it's a value add? Uh, I think it's more, I, I don't know that they're prepared to pay more, but they're more willing to exclude buildings that don't have those credentials. So it's, it's. I think if you're going to attract tenants and the tenant pool is broader, um, then, you know, as a, as a landlord, that's what you have to focus on because I think the ones that don't, they're going to lose tenants and ultimately it'll be reflected in values because the tenant pool that you can choose from is getting more and more limited. This is, might be completely um, different uh, and, and it probably shows the, the, the lack of my knowledge on the sector, but is it possible that these, these premises can be converted to something else? So we've seen things like um, that we work at my PO advice back finally in the last week or so. Um, and then we have, you know, the potential to even convert those spaces into something else, like a retailer would say from putting more services in there. Do you, have you seen it? Have you had any example? Do you have any examples of um, office spaces where they've kind of been repurposed and that's been successful? You have seen it. It, it, it tends to be cyclical. So um, I was talking about Perth before and old office buildings. In the 90s, they converted a lot of them into hotels um, because there was a shortage of hotels. You know, they were, you know, these office buildings occupied good space, um, but there was no demand for office. So a lot of them got got converted to hotels um, for, uh, I mean, y- you have seen, you know, other conversions. So in the Sydney CBD, you saw seven or eight buildings come down um, for metro stations. Um, so you've seen, you know, supply taken out. Um, and then you have seen some other office buildings converted for other uses, but it, it, it can be quite expensive and it depends on how old they are, you know, with ceiling heights, et cetera, yeah. and where the, where the cores good. are as well. So that there's, you know, there has to be sufficient natural light. Yeah, that's really interesting because I was actually talking to my partner about this the other day. We're thinking, you know, what's what's the useful life of one of these buildings that gets put up in, in a CBD? How long do they last? And how do they how do they tell the tenants that uh, actually we're taking down the building? Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Uh, um, so I, I've got kind of a couple of final questions here. And this more relates to, and I think it loops back into where we, where you talked about kind of being that risk averse kind of investor and your early experiences through the, through the recession in the early nineties. Um, obviously with yields being, you know, on a downward trajectory for so long in some parts of the world, they're negative. And then more recently we've seen, we've seen an uptick in, in yields uh, for investors who are thinking about, Oh, well, interest rates are could rise and um, you know, the yields are expanding. I should be really careful of being around the REIT sector because, you know, the leverage and all those things that we kind of at a high level, we associate with property. Um, Do you think that, is there anything there that if people are making that trade-off now, um, what are some of the things that they should be considering? And do you see things like an unwinding of negative, negative rates or negative yields? Do you, do you see that as a key risk for the sector? It's it's a difficult question and it's a difficult issue for central banks at the moment. Um, They've tried so long to generate inflation. Um, you know, you've got into this situation where there's so much debt uh, globally, whether it's held on private balance sheets, or public balance sheets, particularly it's grown particularly high in the last uh, year as governments have, have bailed out the private sector. Um, you know, there's three ways to get rid of it. There's um, you can default, which is not preferable. You can repay it, which um, the eurozone tried to do in 
um, 2012 to 2015, which was painful, and the UK tried that too. Um, or you can generate inflation and deflate that amount of debt away. And so central banks have been trying to generate inflation uh, for a very long period of time. They've failed at it for the last 20 years. Um, it seems to be getting a bit of traction at the moment. Um, who knows whether it's sustainable or not, whether it gets incorporated into wages so that it actually feeds into itself. It's difficult to say. Looks like that's happening in the US, but it's difficult to know how sustainable it is. Um, so they've been trying to generate inflation for a long period of time, um, but they haven't haven't been overly successful. And I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm, I, I don't know whether inflation will persist, um, but, uh, you know, central banks have been trying to generate it so that they, they want to see it. So I think they're going to be reluctant to raise interest rates until they see it sustained. Um, and uh, the, you know, I guess the way that we're seeing inflation at the moment and the type of inflation that you're seeing at the moment isn't the type of inflation that actually um, responds to interest rates because it's supply-based rather than demand management-led, which is what interest rates are for. Um, they're you know, designed, I guess, you know, lifting interest rates to, to moderate aggregate demand, um, whereas this is all supply constraints. So um, what I'm trying to say is that I I, I'm kind of doubtful that they're going to be able to lift rates um, much in the future. Uh, one, because of the absolute levels of debt, and two, whether inflation is actually going to be sustained. Mm. That's, yeah, that's fascinating. So um, I guess it's just how we, where we see it, um, it take its impact. So where that where that inflation takes a hold would be would be crucial to kind of the outlook. But yes, I guess, that's right. Yeah. So I guess. For the property sector in general, and this comes back to what we we're saying before about typically CPI linked. Um, I guess then it, it probably for many investors that are thinking about it, it's probably not as scary as many of them would imagine because there is some protection there. When you, you said before that leases were basically one of the most, if not the most important things because they determine the valuations and how you can support that leverage. If if you're thinking about if you're if, when you're looking at REITs, um, are you looking for long whales? Are you looking for uh, anything in particular that protects against inflation, even if that risk was to eventually? I, I'm not saying that you you do think that, but if you were concerned about that, are there some kind of tricks of the trade that our listeners could could jump to? Um, well, it's both. So we look at um, long leases for particular asset classes, you know, so that they have fixed increases. So, um, so for particular asset classes, maybe for, for office, um, for things like petrol stations, for childcare, you know, where you have some CPI linked um, bumps every year, so increases every year. Um, but for things like logistics, so industrial assets, Ironically, you're actually looking for shorter leases because rental growth is so strong, you want to be able to capture it by having a market review. Um, and there's also development upside um, if the actual industrial premises can be, you know, converted to a higher and better use uh, or even just to better industrial uh, and indes better industrial like, distribution centre. So um, depending on the asset class, you might want short leases if there's a lot of rental growth at the moment. Um, but if you know, I guess if if you've got an asset class where there's less uh, barriers to entry, you obviously want a long lease, um, which which protects you um, uh, from from a lease expiry and potentially maybe you know lower market rental rates sometime in the future. So it it depends on the asset class, um, but real estate does provide some inflation hedge, um, particularly because a, a number of the leases are actually CPI linked. The other thing is you've got replacement costs. So I don't know about you, but if you've tried um, getting a, a, a construction worker or, you know, a, a, a tradie to come to your house to fix things, you know, those rates are only going up. And if you apply that to the construction of, say, an office building, um, you know, replacement costs are, are rising. And it's a function of the land value, but it's also a function of building materials and the cost of labour. So, you know, there is there is a um, an inflation hedge by investing in real estate. That's really interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that at the kind of the, the much much larger level. I, I have been doing some work around here, and I could, <laughs> and everyone knows that listens to this that owns a property how expensive it is. Um, so that, that that's really interesting too. There, um, yeah. So I guess the, the final question I did have for you was just around um, one thing you would tell yourself about, um, or tell your younger self about money, finance, life, or business. Um, what would it be? I think you may have answered that, but I think it's worth asking again. If there's one thing you would tell your younger self, what would you? What would it be? I'd tell my younger self. I'm not sure that I'd listen though. Um, I was always really good on um, saving money, um, so um, I was always yeah, 
right from right from the get go. Um, my first paycheck, really good at saving money, um, but I was never good at taking risks. Um, very risk averse. Um, my dad gave me some really good advice when I started in broking. Um, my dad uh, worked in hematology and he told me to invest in CSL, which the my, the, my, the broking the broker that I worked for did the um, did the IPO. Um, and I, you know, I didn't listen to him. I, I bought a house instead, which, you know, look, wasn't a bad thing to do in 1994, a house in Annandale, which, you know, is a nice suburb. Um, but had I bought, had I listened to him, had I had more um, uh, confidence, um, I would have made a lot more money. Anyway, so uh, ha having more confidence and, and uh, investing for the long term as opposed to um, just trying to protect everything in the short term. Mm. Well, well, Julia, many of your accolades um, are speaking for themselves in, in recent times. Um, I know uh, you and the team have won quite a few awards um, in recent years. And um, for, those, for those listeners who are interested in hearing more about what you have to say and um, finding out more about the funds that you run, uh, where would they go to find that? Is that best on the website or? Yeah, if they go to the Panda website, they can see uh, all the investment options uh, and decide for themselves. Yeah, wonderful. Well, Julia, thanks for taking some time to join me on the program today. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Owen. Thank you for having me.